Welcome to the Whitney Museum of American Art. I'm Margie Weinstein from the museum's education department, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to tonight's program, a conversation between Robert Irwin and Donna DeSalvo. Hopefully you've had a chance to explore the fourth floor installation, which is really extraordinary. It will be open after tonight's talk, and it's on view through September 1st. So I encourage you to come back, revisit it over the next five weeks. It's truly, um, in its very essence, a piece that demands and rewards close looking. Robert Irwin has said that perception is the essential subject of art, and his work is rigorously committed to challenging viewers' understanding of the world around them. In 1977, the Whitney, in fact, provided the conditions of possibility for Irwin's work around this notion, and the first installation of Scrim Veil, Black Rectangle, Natural Light, Whitney Museum of American Art, New York, was the catalyst that set the course for his future career. As Irwin stated, the ordinary, could we but see it, is just as extraordinary <coughs> as the highest consciousness <coughs> imaginable. And in a way, the Whitney, far from launching my disappearance, poured me back into the world. The resulting body of work and the myriad ways in which it shaped viewers' experiences of space and recognition of the mundane as surprisingly wondrous has made him one of the truly great American artists. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce oh Robert Irwin and Donna DeSalvo. We are delighted, uh, Bob, to have you here on the occasion of the reinstallation of Scrim Veil, vale, Black Rectangle, Natu Natural Light, Whitney Museum, 1977. Nice it's a great title. <laughs> it's a great title. In fact, you don't even have to write an essay. They just have the title that goes with it. Um, but, you know, this has been a particularly good year for you uh, with this project from the past, but also some of the projects that have been happening both in the U.S. and Europe. So I think we'd like to show the audience some of the projects that you've been working on, and uh, we can just go through them. Well, we'll probably, it's all of the projects. <laughs> well, all of the projects. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's some in your head, but they're not realized yet. Yeah, so. uh, the main, main reason I wanted to, uh, to do this is that, oh, main reason I wanted to do this is that uh, uh, hopefully I'll talk a little bit about the idea of conditional, which is sort of central to everything. And one of the things I like about the year, having a good year, is, where, is I think there's an interesting variety that says that each one is a, a different and a, a unique uh, uh, installation. So, All right. roll them. So this, I believe, is the courthouse in San Diego. This is a, a piece that I did in 1971. Uh, this is a piece I did in 1971, and it's never had a home. And uh, finally... Uh, uh, it had a lot of disasters in the middle, but uh, I finally gave it to uh, the government for a federal courthouse in, in San Diego. And this is the column, seeing it installed. It's 32 feet high, uh, weighs about two ton, and we, we made it in the backyard, uh, <laughs> literally with hand routers and, and sanders. And at the time we built it, it was the third largest um, uh, optical element in the world. Niagara. Niagara, yeah. I actually started naming things after a while because we couldn't remember everything. We kept getting lost, Joey and myself, and uh, so we named this Niagara, but don't take it seriously. <laughs> It's in uh, is that Albright, Knox. Albright Knox. And, and it's uh, interesting, right, because it's on a hallway, so you have an oblique angle, yes? One of the problems uh, with these is that everyone wants to look at them pictorially, not to stand in the middle. But they're really much more fun if you walk through them or buy them in a way. They almost develop a kind of musical score to them. There are lots of complicated rhythms that are taking place. And this is the view from across across the courtyard. Yeah. This is your project for Pace at the Uptown facility. Mm -hmm. 
you're looking at a, a window that has a hole in it. Um, most people did not know there was a hole in the window <laughs> until they finally uh, made be too much noise. And this, this does have a, uh, uh, a title. It yeah. does? Well, isn't it dotting the I's and crossing the T's? Oh, oh as the a exhibition kind of, had a, the exhibition. a loose title. Okay, all right. Trotting the I's and crossing the T's. T's. Everyone thought I was dying, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the view the, out the, the window. The first photograph was actually a view of a black painting that you were in to look. And then this one is what it's looking at. The Great Fuller Building. This is a project I've been working on for 20 or 30 years, but I worked on it this year also. It's uh, Getty Garden. What, what year was, um, because these, these are photographed at different times, correct? Do we know when this photograph was taken, Joey? Yeah, this is a thing that changes all the time, doesn't it? Uh, gardens tend to do that. <laughs> One of the nice things about gardens is the audience. Uh, I've never met a friendlier audience. That people are genuinely pleased. They want to hug you. They they literally do. They stand and clap. Uh, it's uh, a kind of an interesting experience after having your ass bust all the time in the art world. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, in LACMA and the Resnick Pavilion and the garden you did there. Yeah, this is a, a, a kind of primordial garden. has the earliest plants on earth, uh, the earliest flowering plants on earth. Part of the reason for that, and also they were going to stop having, uh, the mayor had announced they were not going to have palm trees in Southern California, which is a hilarious idea. Uh, and there had never been a, a palm garden, actually, in, in uh, downtown L.A. or in, the, in uh, There was one out in Pasadena to a degree. So I thought it was an interesting opportunity. And I'm still working on that one. They've run out of money. I won't go into the details. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of the project downtown uh, for, that you did at Pace, also part of the dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Yeah, I'm showing this one because uh, it was, it was uh, not very successful, so I'm going to take one more shot at it. You'll, okay, we'll go into that. I, I want to know that. And then, and then this is the uh, project that you did recently in London, Pace at London. Who's afraid of red, yellow, and blue? This is uh, the view sort of when you walk in, which I was pleased by because I was deeply confused by it. Uh, you don't know what you're really looking at. For example, the, the windows at the top are not there. You're not sure if you're seeing through a piece of glass or whether or not that's how they uh, are, you know, elaborated on. They're mind-boggling when you see them in photographs. They're just, I mean, I saw this and it was just so extraordinary. But the photograph is the photograph. <clears throat> Brilliantly done, I might say. You have a great I, photographer. I, I, I found a brilliant <laughs> photographer. Guy can make me look like a champ. This is a, a particularly good one. It shows the complexity of it. Uh, it looks like there's a whole space down below, and there's like a whole space up above. So it's a, a fun to kind of uh, spend a minute with it. What? Uh, describe what it is. Actually, they're just uh, panels of... Uh, uh, it's a rosin-coated material. It? Honeycomb aluminum that had been... Uh, polished and sanded Sorry. with 40 coats of paint, and uh, it took about uh, a little time to do that. Does that describe it for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, here I think being there see, helps. Yeah, when you see people in it too, and this is this is the other side of the Royal Academy building in London, yeah. which I think was the Museum of Man, if I remember correctly. Which I don't know where the Museum of Man moved. I hope Man Up isn't down. over. Unless woman is just taking over, but that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's get into that. <laughs> and then this is um, probably the uh, again the most. These, all of these have happened certainly uh, in the in the last six months practically, or last three months. Uh, this is at the Vienna Secession, which is an extraordinary building uh, dating from the early part of the 20th century, and this is called double blind. Uh, 
it's a, quite a space, artist space that they've been taking care of, maintaining and programming for, I don't know, what? Uh, uh, years, more so. than a hundred years. Yeah, and uh, this particularly good one there, this, the lady in the middle of that is my daughter. And uh, I've mentioned that because I found out something about her. Um, she'll hate this. <laughs> but I found out something about her that is really special to me, and that is she can see. Watching her move through it, people can't see without using their body. Uh, you can't, you know, you, they're not separate. And you can watch somebody move and you know whether they can see or not, and she can see, which is, was a thrill. <laughs> Another view? Yeah. This is looking all the way through uh, to a park out in the back. And the door would be, the door is open, literally, during the course of the exhibition yeah. into, the, into the outside world, so to speak. Always looking for a little help from nature. Another view. Okay. That's good. Okay. Well, I think what's so amazing and what these photographs, as brilliant as they are, make clear is the fundamental nature of experience. And, you know, how you have said that perception really is the subject of art. Change. change that from perception to seeing. Perceptions have become so loaded now and used for so many various activities that it no longer has much edge to it. You want to change it to S seeing? Seeing is not great either, but uh, it'll have to do in the clutch here. Well, given that, um, I, the question, you know, I think, to ask that I'd like to ask just to start and we'll talk more about um, the work Bob's been doing this past year and the whole idea that um, you speak about which is the nature of site conditioned. Now we're so used to the word site specific it's become almost now really just a sort of I'm sure it, uh, uh, we think about it all the time as so many artists work in that way but site conditioned is a very different uh, kind of idea. And I just thought, since we're upstairs, is this extraordinary work of yours, um, one thing I would like to ask you is, what was it like seeing this piece, first of all? Um, well, uh, what's very nice, this, is the first, uh, this was done, what, 35 years ago 35. upstairs. And uh, it's the first time anybody's ever put one up again. I've been doing them in places all over, the, you know, wherever anybody would let me for a long time. And of course, they don't transfer, and I've never sold one. Uh, they're not really saleable, and um, uh, it, uh, and no one's ever hung them a second time. So this has been a really interesting experience for a change to see it. I think it's really good myself, uh, <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. It's an extraordinary piece, and I think this idea to talk about the difference between, as you see it, between site-specific and site-conditioned. <laughs> Um, well, you start out, I, I don't know if I coined the thing in the beginning, 35 years ago I started talking about trying to lay out that there was, a, 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 originally with, where you had a, a soldier on a horse with a sword and he'd saved the city, and so s sculpture was used oftentimes as dedications or as, in a sense, uh, a, a concrete moment about the history of the place that it was in. So it was site dominant, that is, you had the soldier on the horse and you built the plaza around him makes perfect sense. Uh, in the recent history of modern art, uh, that become modified to what you could call site adjusted, where uh, you maybe are in the same plaza, you still build it in the studio, and you uh, come to the site and maybe uh, paint it blue or, or red or make it a little bigger or whatever, so that it is adjusted and you know, acknowledges the site. The third one is site specific which is something which is made for that site, but it's still essentially made elsewhere in most cases, and you bring it to the site. And most of them are not so site-specific. I mean, one of the artists that is most thought about for that is, is Richard Serra, but they're not really that specific. They're always being moved uh, and put someplace else. Uh, so, it, 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 but it also, in a sense, is not necessary, in, is using Serra again, You've seen 50 Sarahs, and they're done in 50 sites, and basically it's the same Sarah. They're good, they're terrific, they do what they do very well, but they are, uh, in a sense, they're movable still. 
what I was, it, 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 the thing about it being site generated or the site condition is that it's, it's much more fun, first of all. Uh, that is, you, you go to the site, somebody asks you possibly, uh, you might do it just to keep an exercise on yourself uh, alone, but you go to the site and you don't have any baggage or you try not to have any baggage, you spend time on it, you walk through it, you spend days, nights, see what happens, see how people use it, then you start making a small circle around it because you don't come from nowhere, you always come from somewhere. So you're already conditioned. Upstairs, for example, the black plane was the first thing that struck me, which is a very powerful plane, and in New York, especially powerful. You just don't see spaces like that. If that thing was in Wyoming, it wouldn't be such a big deal, possibly, because their space and our understanding of, of distance and all that is much greater uh, uh, in a, on a greater scale. So the idea of, of starting out with that plane, I look, looking at it, I, I immediately I wanted the space. Uh, and it was supposed to be a, a retrospective. But I, I kept saying, no, no, I really, you know, I'd like to work with the space, give me time. Then a fortunate thing happened. Uh, the curator got fired. <laughs> It was a, a, a blessing in disguise, in disguise. So um, I, I then I kind of took license, took all the stuff, the old, uh, the paintings and stuff that I had done years and years ago and stuffed them in the back and, and cleared that room out. Um, and uh, the architect uh, gave me some incredible things to work with. As you see, the, this black plane, which is really quite a powerful thing. And they also gave me this not very good ceiling up above. Uh, a kind of grid ceiling, ceiling as such, but he also put a beautiful black line around that window. And the window is a very, very powerful element. The architect, it was his revenge. I mean, without he didn't probably announce it, but he made it very clear in a sense that that was a pictorial thing. The, the scale of it and the relationship of the edges of that are perfect for the building across the street, which means it became an almost impossible place to put a painting. And since it overpowered pretty much everything that was around it, um, I thought that was very humorous, very interesting thing. So I wanted to, to put that in play with regards to what I think he was thinking, as it were. Um, the one single gesture uh, and the black line around it, uh, that was uh, serendipity. You know, I got lucky, came up with a reasonably good idea, simple, clean, and to the point. That answer your question. Yep, it does All indeed. Right. I mean, I think one thing people don't always realize, and even myself, looking at the catalog, is this whole project as something called the New York Projections, and the idea that you looked at the conditions that exist within the Breuer building, the black square, the grid of the ceiling, the natural light, and then created projects uh, outside, one at 42nd, the intersection of 42nd and 5th Avenue, and the other, a uh, rectangle that was drawn between two buildings right in front of the World Trade Center. So this idea of, again, kind of going beyond the standard notion of what constitutes a work of art and into the world. Um, how did that come about at that time? Well, again, the thing about the working conditionally is that uh, uh, you're learning all, of it, all the time. There's not... Uh, uh, something you come with preconceived ideas, you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know if it's even going to work. When I was putting this thing up, uh, the, the, all the technicians here and the engineer came by and said, well, that, that material's not going to hold that. It's going to fall to the floor when you let it down. And uh, I didn't think so, but after he'd been saying it for a week and a half, I started beginning to worry that it was going to fall to the ground. It, it didn't. Uh, uh, which is, thank you. Uh, at uh, um, now I've lost my, my line of thought, but uh, but this the, going into the world with those kinds well, of it, uh, you know, a couple of uh, uh, questions have been have become my am an addict about questions. Uh, uh, do you want me to go through it a little bit? Sure. Uh, you know, I started as a painter and uh, not very good, and uh, big muddy abstract expressionist paintings, uh, full of vim and vigor, and also just full of mistakes and bullshit. Uh, and uh, uh, and so I took a hard look at them, and I realized they were not very good, and that uh, there was too many things in there. And one of the problems for me was that everyone kept roar shocking them. Ah, oh, it's it's a cow jumping over the moon, or it's this, you know, or psychoanalyzing, saying, oh, it's the artist has a had a bad night and uh, a bad dinner last night. <laughs> so you know, and I, that immediately killed it for me. I mean, for me, 
the minute it had any kind of meaning or references was a problem. So I began, in a sense, uh, I saw two paintings, the first abstract expressionist paintings I saw. They had a show in L.A. It was an interesting show. And the first two paintings, when you walk through the dinosaurs, because it was in the Natural History Museum, we didn't have a museum in those days, a very primitive city. And uh, uh, when you were walking through, the first two I saw was at James Brooks. Um, it was 12 foot by 6 foot, big painting, bright red, bright green, bright black, white. In other words, a powerful painting. And I was starting to get, especially with those meaty things, trying to get into the power of the thing and give it something more than just an image or a kind of a sign system. And uh, right next to it was a little Philip Guston, uh, which you're familiar with, the, the scrumbly little pinks and greens and real soft. And from 50 yards away, the Guston blew the James Brooks off the wall. And so the question became, how is that possible? How can this little thing with modest means completely overpower that big thing with, in a sense, exaggerated means? That's a hell of a question. And uh, so I started trying to pursue that in a way and tried to uh, figure out how you made, because the key was that in the James Brooks, two and two made four. But in the, in the Gustin, two and two never made less than five. And that there's this exchange of energy. It was all of a good painting. And you've got to know something about that if you want to make a good painting. Uh, so I started doing that. And I started taking the kind of uh, uh, useless things out of the painting and getting rid of them. Um, and through a process, uh, not very smart. Uh, I, I grew up in L.A. Uh, playing uh, uh, surfer and uh, dancing at nights. And uh, uh, so I, you know, I had a lot of superficiality and lacked... Uh, um, concentration. So I was beginning to learn all that thing at the time. And the questions, uh, the painting started in a sense slowly uh, being taken apart. And, uh, I, and then one of the first problems I had was that um, the, uh, uh, the scale of the paintings, which I loved and which I needed, it was scale being a major item in the abstract expressionist period, simply because it's the first time it became a free agent was no longer attached to something. So scale was important, but for me, it was overwhelming me in that I was making, there were too many periphery things that I didn't control. So it became necessary at one point to start doing small paintings. I just happened to be lucky and got thrown out of my studio at that time and found a little small house to work in. And I started doing paintings no bigger than that. And, uh, uh, and I uh, uh, framed them in a way so that you could hold them. But uh, uh, what the beauty of them, hopefully was at the time, that like a good raccoon bowl, everything counted. Uh, the slightest stuff, you, you know, the intimacy of the relationship allowed you to really start feeling the tactfulness of a painting and the, and the physicality of how things actually acted and interacted. It brought it all into focus, this larger one I couldn't control at that time. So having gotten past that thing, it asked another really interesting set of questions is that why did I need all this stuff in the painting? Uh, all these different elements were signed. And I decided that the way to escape that was to use basically a straight line, which had the least connotations, least meaning of any kind. And uh, so I started doing these paintings. And at first, they were like pickup sticks. They were interesting, interlocking, as it were. And as time went on over a period of years, I suddenly ended up with four straight lines on the painting, usually two of one kind and two of another. And uh, I was as surprised as anybody else. I mean, a little shocking that can I really make a painting with just four straight lines on it? Um, I liked them, though. You know, I was interested in them. I, and then the question became, who puts the lines on? Am I putting the lines on? Or is there some rhyme or reason that, in a sense, is making this thing happen that way? Uh, an unanswerable question, as it were. But it became one of these things where I went through a whole period of time. Um, uh, it was a strange process in which I would paint every day. I painted seven days a week, every day, all day. And uh, I would, and I would in, a, in a month or two, have a painting with four lines. But in between, I'm looking and watching, and I'm going, falling asleep. I fell asleep 20 times a day. I mean, it was, it was like almost mesmerizing. And there was this whole thing of focusing, concentration, and the idea that the thing is actually mesmerizing you. And... Uh, so, uh, again, it was a, a, a process. Then at one point, uh, I uh, thought, oh, you know, uh, at this point, I, I, 
Well, I need the lines. I mean, there really uh, some questions. Obviously, how do you paint a painting without something on it or a mark in a way? So I got into the saying of energy, which I've been talking about, and maximized it with some dot paintings in which I put these small dots all next to each other, blue or black or whatever, and, and the opposite color in between every single one of them. A painful process, let me tell you. Uh, I used to have to do them with dark glasses on in a dark room and listen to baseball games to keep my attention span. I'm not a baseball fan. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but so doing these things all day long was, uh, uh, and I finally accomplished a painting that I think was just pure energy. The interaction between the elements, which you couldn't see per se, but they created a field of energy. The, the, I won't go into the, the thing was curved slide and everything to break the whole frame of the And then one day I'm sitting there looking at this painting and I say to myself, my God, this painting is pretty good. And I say, but you know something? That's not how we see. We don't see the world in frames. We see the world with our body, with all of our senses, all in a sense in play and a kind of symphony of action and activities. Very interesting question. I mean, and hard to argue with. I mean, we don't see that way. And I realized that painting and making objects, it's a highly stylized learned logic and a game of meaning. And then I'm really, in a sense, focused on what I thought the issue really was. So all of a sudden, in the middle of nowhere, I'm not a painter anymore. Uh, and I just kind of got reasonably good at it. But the question is too overpowering. It's a powerful question. You look at the painting, and it's really, in a sense, there's another funny thing. There's a shadow around it. There's always been a shadow around it, but of course we'd ignore the shadow because the shadow has no meaning. What's there? We can even put it on a velvet wall. What difference does it make? Because the thing actually sometimes even has a big gold frame all the way around it, which in terms of meaning, in a sense, was without meaning and therefore not a real issue in the painting. Not true. You know, that's not how it is. That's not how we see it all. So I asked myself a simple question. What, what is the difference here? And the difference is very, very, very obvious, and that is it qualitatively and quantitatively they're understood. One is understood and the other is not at all. Quantitatively, you can measure it, you can weigh it, or excuse me, you can't measure it and you can't weigh it, and if the lights move, it's gone altogether. So, uh, uh, it, but qualitatively, you couldn't see without it. It's absolutely crucial to how we perceive or how we see the world. You can't see them without the shadows. So here, now I have something that is a real meaning in one world and of no meaning in another. Now, Nobody else is paying attention to this thing, and maybe I'm full of shit, but uh, actually I thought it was a pretty interesting question. It was so interesting that I couldn't be a painter anymore, and I couldn't have a studio anymore. Uh, I didn't know what to do or how one dealt with it. How do you function in the world, you know, actually work in the world in the, in the day-to-day -day activities and deal with the things you see that are more beautiful than anything you've ever made? Maybe you ever will make. So I had to abandon the studio and uh, went off into the desert for four four years and uh, uh, played with myself and uh, sat in, uh, in, uh, you know, in waiting and in seeing the kind of qualities that were going on. Brilliant things. And I thought, you know, one of the problems here is that uh, this thing is, I would make a, I'd make a sight line, uh, which was very interesting and almost like what the Indians would do, like a power spot and where there's this wonderful thing happening. And then you say to yourself, well, now, can I take that back to New York? And the answer is no. It's ridiculous. It can't be done. And I asked myself, well, I don't want to take bus tours out there. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't make much sense. <laughs> I mean, I could do it. Maybe, you know, if I charged it up, I'd actually make a living. Uh, so, uh, but, and I'll stop at that point. But the questions are, were too good. And to me, the whole activity of being an artist has a lot to do with questions. The beauty of questions is that they are, in a sense, full of I mean, they're fertile. And essentially, answers are always temporary. They always ask another set of questions. And so the real motive and the more, more excuse me, powerful moment is the moment when you actually have a good question, a real good one, that you're willing to live with. That's great. Thank you. That was, I mean, the one thing that, you know, I, I was so struck by um, was this idea that you've talked about, this piece, um, as being the X that marks the spot, and even the earlier scrim pieces, the X that marks the spot where you jumped off. And this idea of really, we were talking earlier today about what it's like the process of actually walking into a site, whether you're talking about the Pace Gallery or the Secession in Vienna, 
uh, or the LACMA garden and walking in with a kind of openness, um, which, uh, you know, we, talk, we were talking a bit about physics, actually, and your experiences in the um, is it a, 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 anechoic chamber, anechoic chamber um, which is a chamber that really has complete sensory deprivation, right? Total. Total. So in 1968, you were uh, invited through the Art and Technology Program to participate in this with, with several other people. And when you talked about this experience of coming out of the chamber, and um, you know, it's in it's in Lawrence Wexler's book, a very great description of this coming out and seeing the world, being completely deprived of everything, of sound, except your own body, of course. That's the one reference point. But what happens when you lose that reference? And and we talked about it as a, as a kind of oblivion. I mean, and, and the negative and the positive of that. I mean, some of us can handle oblivion. Some of us can't. I don't like <laughs> the, the word oblivion. It's scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take that off the table. Yeah, let's do. Okay, all right. <laughs> but when you remove that kind of reference, in a sense, and that's the series, that's the question. So every time is a question, essentially, when you approach a site. Yeah, the fun thing is you actually can surprise yourself because you're not stuck in the studio having to rely on some kind of magical way of organizing a style or an understanding or whatever, but you're discovering things. And all the pieces are full of things that I would have never thought to do and never would have conceived to do it or a material I would never even considered using. So it's also a very interesting game. I mean, it's the best game in town because you actually every now and then you do something that just knocks your socks off. How do you maintain that kind of openness uh, where you really are, are able to go in and, and be so perceptive and aware? Uh, I mean, Practice. Okay. <laughs> Actually, and being a little simple-minded helps a lot. <laughs> well, I'm, and I'm curious about the different materials, too, because I think what strikes me so much over this past year in particular is the range, the diversity of materials that you've been working uh, with, whether it's this highly reflective uh, painted honeycomb material or the fluorescent bulbs in Niagara, or even working with plants, which to me I find actually one of the most kind of extraordinary things. Uh, because you, they're never fixed. I mean, they have a life of their own. You can't plan nature. You can only court it. I have a question I wanted to ask you, which is what you see as a distinction between when you do these some of the projects like the Getty Garden or other, uh, the Dia Garden or LACMA, in your head, what, what do you think land art is? It was a question I wanted. I meant to ask you that I didn't, but I'm sort of curious about what do you see as when people do land art? I have no idea why they do it. I, I mean, <laughs> seriously, I don't. It's not something I've thought about at no, but all. But it's a completely different. It's completely different. And I'm just curious about when you work with the garden situations. Well, the, uh, to kind of lead up to it a little bit, this progression that I've been going through, as it were, uh, what also starts to happen is that uh, you uh, find yourself... Uh, dealing with all kinds of situation. And what, what happened was I got asked to, to uh, tr start a dialogue with the Miami International Airport. And they bought three artists down there, and they promised each of us that we could make a small piece in the, in the thing. The other two architects, and the people wanted to have a dialogue. They were trying to get their foot in the door at the airport. And so they were bringing us in to have a conversation, intrigue these people to play with us. And uh, the other two artists decided very quickly that they weren't going to be able to do anything, so they left. But the idea of a dialogue and the idea of the challenge of having to deal with an entire airport, which is probably the most complex well, single entity well, within well. a city these days. It's, a, it's the entrance to the city. It's the image of the city, the complexity of the schedules and the planes and all that. I thought it was a great, really great challenge. I knew I was not going to be able to do anything, but I spent three years doing a master plan for the entire airport. Uh, that included roads, that included garages, it included arrival, exit, etc. Um, and all the amenities that go on. Miami Airport is a particularly interesting one because it's the jump off place between the United States and S Central and South, Central America, South America and also t to Europe. So it had a very strange schedule in that uh, passengers left, they arrived somewhere in the late afternoon, mostly from different parts of the United States and would leave 11 and 12 o'clock at night. 
So you had an audience that, in a sense, not like. When you come to an airport, you, are, you arrive, the first thing you do is you go in, you find out where your ticket is, and you get your ticket, and you find, no matter how long, half an hour, ten minutes, whatever, you go to the gate. You make sure the gate is there, and it's not going to move. And then you have ten minutes, you just sit there. You have a half an hour, you start to move in that much. You have an hour, you know, again, further and further and further. And the uh, different uh, people that used the South Americans always came in groups and with friends and family, and they wanted to group very close together. The businessmen leaving uh, New York and going down to the Bahamas, they all wanted to sit spaces apart and, or in some kind of order. So testing all this, putting all the chairs loose in different terminals and just watching the behavior and how people use it. Also, you start to discover quickly that, that the beauty of, of, of railroad stations, the ancient ones, was that you were actually there, seeing the engine and the power of it, and you were in the middle of what, the, what was happening there. Uh, but people being afraid of airplanes, you realize very quickly that they um, started masking it. In other words, you don't get to see the planes. Uh, people are afraid you go in those little tunnels. You don't get to see them going in. And so you start thinking around that the, the whole thing of the airfare is really the main event there and what's going on. So you start trying to bring all that back into it. Um, this particular airport, people got lost. They had very bad signage. Uh, so you got to, I got to deal with everything. And I got within a, that close of actually implementing this plan. And the uh, Dick Judy, who was uh, the head of the airport, uh, operators Association, whatever, and been there for 20 years, uh, he got, he didn't get fired, he quit. Uh, Cuban, uh, the Cuban Revolution took place in Miami, and um, the, uh, the middle part of, uh, of, uh, of Miami became mostly Cuban. Everybody else, white flight, ran out to the, to the suburbs. The first mayor was elected. He looked around at the city and said, hell, everything in here is, you know, losing money except the airport. And so he decided from now on, everything from the airport goes through me. And so the guy quit, and that was the end of the project. Spent three years, but boy, was I going to graduate school. <laughs> I mean, I learned so much that when the Yeti came up, uh, uh, I was prepared for it, I had to deal with it. And part of the, the thing about the Getty or, or gardens and that was not a question of being a gardener. I'd never planted a plant in my life. So it was a pretty good sized challenge. Also, Richard Meyer wanted me out of there. So we spent a year wrestling over the same in his office, and he would look at my plans, and he would say he'd have a guy whose job it was to see any economical problems because he knew I was, in a sense, not qualified. So if he could point out that I was full shit, bang, he could get rid of me. And he'd have another guy whose job was to look at it logistically and decide whether or not I was making sense with the thing. Uh, not, but the point is, so we went that through that 11 months. He also had an intellectual apologist whose job it was to tell everybody why his plan was brilliant and mine was full of shit. So, <laughs> but it was, it is was that a one staff of, position? I would have. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, actually, I went, I went through three intellectual apologists in the 11 months. It was fun. I was just knocking their heads off. But, you know? uh, uh, but it was a, a, a great uh, a, a learning process. We had an amazing learning process, and uh, uh, they finally decided, you know, to let me do it. Now, in doing the garden, I, I, I took me five years to to do to lay that thing out. And in the very beginning, for example, this is a good example. I I, I ended up putting there was a fall line, and so I put a, a stream down the fall line, which is a sort of natural idea, natural thing to do. And then the natural thing was for you to follow the stream. People will walk along the stream. That's the, sort of the way we experience things and such. And uh, the handicapped people came along and said, uh-uh, you can't do that. I said, what do you mean I can't do that? We can't go down, we can't walk down. And so I riled for a while about this whole thing about that 3% of the, of, of, the, of, the, of the population is controlling 97%. That seemed a little bit out of, out of whack for me. But I had a mother-in-law at the time who I used to, had to wheel her around in a wheelchair. So I understood the problem. The solution was actually very simple. It's something I'd learned. Uh, what's his name up at, at Berkeley, the, the linguist? What? Yeah, Lakoff. He, he has a book called uh, Something to Do with Metaphors. Uh, a terrific book. It, it basically, what he was saying is that metaphors win all conversations. 
And they, what, what they, their metaphor was in presenting is equal access. I mean, how do you argue with that? That's it's impossible. Sure, of course, equal access. That's a motto within this country in a way. And, but here it is not as such. Um, so I riled against four. And then I finally just took it. And I, in one night, made this path go back and forth. St curved, straight, 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 curved. And it was the best move I made in the whole thing. It was sensational. Everything suddenly opened up. It's that thing about this process that has this, all this discovery in it because you're, you're living it moment to moment and you're dealing with real issues and real people. It was people one of the conditions. Yeah, one it was of one the of conditions. the conditions of the, exactly. of the project and site. So it's a long story, but anyway, uh, uh, it was the best move I ever made and certainly one of the best moves I made in that garden. Um, the beauty of the garden, like I said, is you can't plan nature, which is an interesting thing to find out. You try things. We would go to, up to the border of Canada, rent a rider truck, four times a year, and we would buy plants all the way down, all the way down, and then we'd plant them out to see what things survive, what things, you know, uh, profit, uh, 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 got better and things. Mm -hmm. that, you know, there are a lot of plants that were like uh, weeds in other parts of the country, but worked very beautiful there. So, a very, very discipline. I, have, I had the, the uh, National Arboretum people came. Every one of them saw five plants that they'd never, they'd never seen before. Uh, which I thought was uh, great because it was a real garden. Uh, and it changed the industry in Southern California. And all the plant, uh, uh, nurseries had to start buying plants that they didn't normally have, which they didn't do before because nobody was buying them. But now all of a sudden, people are seeing things they really wanted. Um, and you'd come to the garden with a plan, and you'd plant it, and then you'd come, and it would be better than you ever thought. I mean, really good. I mean, that idea of how things change over time in the context of a garden, it really, but it's not, it's not it, it, dissimilar to any, to the piece upstairs or the, the installation in London because they change all the time. I mean, the great thing I've found with, with your work upstairs is being there early in the morning and being there, actually late at night has become my new favorite time. 8.31 <laughs> is when the sun sets. And it's extraordinary to see how the space becomes even more nuanced because your, your eye is actually forced to work harder in a way because it becomes darker and darker. And the distinctions between the tones are, are harder to, uh, to perceive. But this idea of things changing all the time, I mean, that's what's so extraordinary about the gardens in that way. Uh, you know. They, 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 I, I kid you, every time I go, it's better than I thought it was going to be. That's really uh, amazing. Which is... You know, it's fun. Really I'm, I'm curious about if you could talk also a little bit about the, the, the master plan you did at Dia Beacon because that is, again, um, it's not just garden. It's a whole experience of through the entire place, through the entire facility from the beginning. I think it starts literally from when you see the first sign and th through the building and then back out the building. Well, uh, what I what actually happened with that after doing the Getty Garden, I started really, and what I had to, what I found out in doing it, is that the question became if we really, if an artist in a sense, go back to I taught a, a, for a while uh, and have done a kind of peripatetic teaching for the last 50 years. I've been in every state in the union, but two, I've sat on corners and talked to students. And the thing about the um, uh, that started to begin is that, uh, that what makes one student different from another? You don't teach people. You uh, work with them, but each one of them has a unique sensibility. And in fact, to teach them is in a sense uh, uh, dis, uh, disservice them. Mm -hmm. it, would, it deflects them towards different ideas or concepts that may be in, fa in fashion. You have to work with each one of them individually and exercise. Like I had students like, uh, uh, who's the guy that, I can't remember names. Uh, Chris Burton, Chris Burton. Uh, and on one hand, and, and Ed Richet on the other hand. And, and, and um, what, Via Selman. And Via Selman. I can't teach those people that. I don't even know what they're doing. <laughs> I mean, Chris Burton was a little dangerous at first, I wondered. Uh, you know, what, what can I, you know, what, what's happening here? Is this guy, uh, but I found out very quickly that he, Everything was very precisely done, so I spent a lot of time with him. And uh, but uh, this idea of a sensibility, I finally became even more s central to what 
but what I'm thinking about in this idea of a conditional life is that in every case, the artist is acting on a sensibility. So the question becomes, in a way, can an artist plan a museum? Can an artist do a garden? Uh, and the answer, of course, is yes. In fact, the idea of the sensibility, the difficulty in a way, is that the way information is processed and how it's applied. Uh, I used to have these meetings at the garden on Monday with 20 people there arguing this and forth about the uh, uh, you know, drainage and the soil and that sort of thing. But can I, and in the very beginning, it made the, the Bugatti very nervous because Richard Meyer would have an immediate answer. Here's a problem. He'd say, well, well, the answer to that problem is this which he did, drove right away from his experience. And I'd say, I'm going to have to go home and scratch my ass about that. <laughs> but so, in the beginning, it made him very nervous, you know. But the question really was that I had to spend time thinking about every one of these aspects, not having an idea or a plan per se in a way. I had to apply my sensibility to it which is a, is a slower, or mm. could, can be a slower mechanism away. How, how did you calibrate that with, I mean, in a sense, there's an aspect of this that's dealing with the sort of bureaucracy and things that work at a, a, in, in a different way or a different pace. Um, how did you manage that one? Well, uh, with patience. <laughs> Uh, because of the, the idea of a sensibility is applying a way of looking at something and applying a set of values that are not basically in play now. Uh, basically, people don't deal with things that way. They don't realize that actually values are made in that process of sensitizing yourself. You place a value on something and you will take care of it. So Ren here wanted me to come to uh, Chicago and, and be involved in a... Uh, um, uh, ec ecology process and I told him I couldn't because I was busy at that time he said don't you're not interested in ecology I said what the hell do you think I've been doing all my life <laughs> I mean, because basically values come if we place a value on the quality of our lives and on the quality of the air and all that sort of thing we would it's not an economic problem it's a value once you really place value on it it becomes no longer in a sense an arguable issue uh, it becomes something that becomes critical to your actual existence in the world. Uh, you can't deal without those things being, in a sense, a piece and a part of the quality of your life. So the idea of an artist functioning in a way in which you actually put those values and that process into play struck me as being worth investigating. So that's basically why I worked at, at DIA, um, besides the fact that uh, Michael Govan asked me. Um, but when he asked me, he wanted me to, and I really wanted to do it at that time. Uh, the, the thing is that he went to the board and he said to the board, I'm bringing Bob Irwin in to be the architect on this building. He said, oh, oh no, we're going to real ac architect. We don't want no asshole artist out there. You're playing around with our building. And, uh, and so, in fact, I did it in, in secret. And I also didn't get paid for it. I, uh, we moved to... To uh, up on the up on up on the Hudson River mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, we in Beacon, worked, New York. Yeah, Beacon, beautiful place, that sort of thing. We worked there. I worked for for a year there, um, working on that project on a day-to-day -day basis, very involved. And I finally sat down with my wife and daughter, and uh, we, mostly my wife, and we start. We talked about what it was like to be on on there, and we both were so depressed. It is so melancholy, and it's George Washington slept here, and the Army, Continental Army, marched there, and and I drive down the roads at night, and it would be trees, and it would be dark. I hadn't wasn't paying that much attention, you know. I was working, but I got in there, and all of a sudden said, Phew, "I get, we got," and we actually got out of there in one day. We did. We didn't even pack up. We asked a friend to pack us up, and we left on a plane like immediately right after that. Zip, we were gone. But it, it was a good lesson because people often ask me, what, 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 you know, what's the light like in California? You guys are interested in light and light in space. And I got a, a real abject lesson. That light, it was beautiful, but it just depressed the hell of me. And I realized why I have a, a lot of optimism. Uh, I'm, I'm an optimist junkie in a way. Uh, growing up in L.A., one of the problems that, that pisses New Yorkers off a lot is when you tell them you had a happy childhood. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was part of my weakness in the beginning, of course. You know, dancing and surfing and all that was so much fun. 
<laughs> it took me a while, and I started rather late as an artist. I don't know if that answers any questions. Oh, question. no, it does indeed. I mean, I think it's... But I think it's a very interesting and important thing that art hasn't really <laughs> touched on, is that to actually act in the world, in a sense, make decisions which actually affect our lives in the immediate sense, and to, in a sense, apply that sensibility, which I think is something you hone after 20, 30, 40 years, you can make some pretty good decisions that would help out things a bit. You mean just in how one lives their life, yeah. not, not just within the realm of art? Yeah, but also not why you don't put those three poles right in the middle so some people have to sit behind it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Breuer, that was... Uh... Hey, I'm not, I'm not going to knock Breuer. There's some really good stuff in this building. <laughs> I, but I just happened to mention that in passing. I mean, one of the things that, you know, our, I first met you, actually, um, in Ohio when I was at the Wexter Center. And, oh, uh, boy, there's a bad building. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's a challenge. I've often said after being a curator there for four years, I could install art in a shoebox. Oh, you could. It, <laughs> it really is a, it's it's a, a challenge. challenging building uh, that you get into a conversation with. But I remember, because you, in fact, were going to do a project at um, Ohio State uh, on, the, on the Oval, um, and I remember this incredible conversation that we had over lunch about Morandi. I mean, we went from talking, I remember distinctly, because we went from talking about <laughs> Fred Astaire, and somehow we got, and Ginger Rogers, of course, and then somehow we got to Morandi. And I was so amazed to hear that you had um, curated been involved in an exhibition at the Ferris Gallery in the early 60s, and you talked about Morandi actually as being the litmus test for abstract expressionism. It just was made me think, and then many years later, I was a curator of Tate Modern and did a Morandi show and reached out, and you yeah. actually sent a great statement for the catalog uh, and just said, you know, it's not about the bottles. <laughs> that, you said more than that, but that was, in a sense, the essence yeah. of it. It was an abject lesson, in a sense, and we did the show to, some, to educate L.A. Basically, we were uh, in a fantasy land because nobody was paying any attention, but at the time, the Ferris Gallery was a kind of group of artists that uh, uh, we banded together, sort of took care of each other and entertained each other, and we did shows at the at the at Ferris which were ones that we were interested in and we thought that a, a Mirandi show the thing is a, a, a flat statement there were no great uh, European abstract expressions so Manessier, Fortier, those people were all second rate and had, didn't have a clue um, but Mirandi was a, was one of the really brilliant abstract expressionist artists and but it, it totally defied it for everybody because I guess because of how he lived and, and how, uh, since he, I don't know, how isolated he was, but also what a great eye he had. He actually painted bottles to start with and in the most, you know, simple kind of uh, uh, still life. And he painted the bottles and he painted the bottles and he painted the bottles. And after a while, the paintings became, they always were, but very economical, a great sense of edge and relationship and, and the quality of a brush stroke uh, was uh, uh, apparent right from the beginning, but at a certain point, he's the only one who actually came in from the opposite side, almost like a Zen process. He actually painted the bottles until they were not about bottles at all anymore. They were about paintings. And when you get near the end and see the simple watercolors and some of the paintings at the end, they are so beautiful and so abstract. Brilliant. <laughs> It made it so influenced. <laughs> I'm becoming a sentimental slob. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say it influenced me in the way that actually curated the exhibition because literally, you know, there were, were a certain series of work where you could see that Mirandi had moved the, the bottle, you know, three centimeters over and then found a series of paintings. And then there were these two extraordinary paintings we tracked down where it was a view through his window, because he did do landscapes yeah. occasionally. And a year later, I think he took a step, one step to the right and painted the same scene. And that kind of, you know, very precise, but then completely different image, just conceptually. It made me actually see Mirandi as a conceptual artist. I don't know if one would call him that, but you I could... Wouldn't, I wouldn't embarrass him with that. <laughs> 
But it, 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 it actually allowed me the, to see Burundi in a very, very different way because, and particularly that body of work from around 49 till about 64, the end of his life, where things become even more and more distilled. He moves away from a more academic uh, uh, subject matter and metaphysical, well, the whole metaphysical thing, but, and, and just very, very distilled. And we just installed them in that way. And it was absolutely you, I mean, maybe, you, well, you don't know that. You completely influenced my thinking about this other artist. I mean, I just, I love the way, you know, things, and it's about being open, I guess, to it all and thinking about well, things. Well, you just got to look at them, and they're really, they're very real. I mean, he really, everything counted, and it was very economical. Uh, no wasted faces, no gestures, no things that were not absolutely intimate to the composition he was putting together. Do you, want, do you want to talk a bit more about this past year and all these different things that you've been working on and, you know, how this, because it's really been like one, literally one thing after another that has been taking place. A, a weird thing has started happening, see, in my life is that for a very long time I got to do and play my game kind of, you know, in, behind the, sha in the shadows, as it were. But suddenly there's a weird thing happening and people are being very nice to me all of a sudden. <laughs> And it's making me very nervous uh, because I don't know, you know, who who are all these people in a way, you know? I'm not sure. I'm sure they're being very kind, but uh, uh, it has been uh, unnerving as a bit. Um, I, I, in terms of the question you just asked, uh, uh, I could probably talk all night about it, but uh, uh, just briefly, uh, I've been getting nice invitations and uh, uh, really interesting ones and ones that actually... Uh, you know, I, as I say, I, I've never sold an, uh, an installation uh, to anybody. And uh, uh, now suddenly there's, there's a complication. There's a possibility that it's going to be around more than a month or a month and a half. And the level of responsibility has raised way up. And uh, the excitement has, has raised way up. And I have a problem. You know, I went through all these years uh, of looking for places. And now all of a sudden people are giving them to me. And I can't turn anything down. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, oh, uh, I've never been so busy in my life and, uh, and having so much fun doing this. That's and, great. But it's uh, uh, alarming, actually. Uh, uh, it's a whole new world. I mean, something's happening. I don't even know. I'm, but I'm going to play it for what it's worth and uh, see if I can't do a few things. Well, I, I mean, I think one of the things that's so astounding about your work and the way you work and this notion of the site condition, which really makes very fundamental the idea of seeing, so we'll get rid of the word perception for a while, yeah. um, and experience, the, the, the fundamental nature of direct, what I'll call direct experience. And I, I use that term because in a mediated world, in a world of the digital, um, we live with images all the time. In fact, I think I had asked you about it, and you said, well, I should ask your daughter more about the whole digital <laughs> realm of things. Um, but but I, I think that there's, a, it, there's an urgency um, with respect to that, and the fact that so many people have come to see this work, linger in this work, so many people have come to see these other works that you've been doing in other places. Uh, I think there's something very profound there that has to do with this hunger, in a sense, for that kind of... Experience. It's almost as if, um, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a bit frightening in a funny way to think that you have to be so urgent about experience. But it does bring back the dilemma, in a sense, of, a, of living in a world where we have mediated uh, experiences and where we see things all the time that function on the level of information. The photographs are great, but, and they have a beauty in their own way, but they're never the experience. There's, uh, there is there, but there's a, a little contradiction for me uh, that because uh, uh, one of the big things I did when I stopped having a studio was deciding that um, I was going to be dealing with energy uh, on some level uh, as opposed to matter. Uh, instead of casting in bronze or doing things in marble, uh, and the part of the issue of that has is more interesting in that. It, it, all of that, and uh, all the idea of, uh, of painting with, uh, what do you call it, with, uh, uh, you know, preparing uh, egg, tempera. egg tempera. I mean, all this commitment to, in a sense, transcendence, about transcending our death, in a sense, going beyond. Uh, and a lot of things in the society are structured around 
this idea of transcending. Um, I think that uh, um, you know you, you, you start out with a beautifully painted uh, uh, David or something, and uh, uh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant in a sense, but within a hundred years. You've got to look at a Malevich with a white square and a white crown. I mean, why in the world would we take something so beautifully put together as, a, as that pictorial reality uh, and, and take all... And, and there was no, there, no one did that. People did it in all kinds of places all over, all over the world. And all that, in a sense, is a question which, uh, why would we do it? You know, I think the issue really became, what is the actual role of art? What is art? contribute in the overall scheme of thing, which is unique, unique to it that it can do to, in a sense, justify its high standing. We build all these castles and, and uh, cathedrals to art, and uh, I think one can question uh, the role of art at this point, and I think it's, it's worth doing. And a little bit that's, I'm not involved in the politics of it, but I think that uh, the real question is, why art in the overall scheme of things? What does it uniquely do that in a sense justifies its high standing. And uh, I think it has to do with this idea of sensibility, bringing to bear, you know, the beauty thing, uh, uh, Malevich in a sense said it, um, when he painted the white square on the white ground, not only his enemies, but his friends said, my God, everything we know and love is gone. I mean, what are you doing? I mean, you've left us with a desert. He said, oh no, yes, but it's a desert of pure feeling. And in a sense, he contested, uh, 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 I think, therefore I am. He essentially states, I feel, therefore I think, and therefore I am. So there's, a, I think, a really interesting issue there uh, as to how and in what way we function as human beings. And that, I'd say, would be a role, since its history leads us to ask that question. I think that's essentially the responsibility of being an artist right now. It's really... Making a living is not the issue. <laughs> Again, I think the the, the kind being loved is not the issue. <laughs> being respected is not the issue. <laughs> Having a career is not the issue. Anyway, I could go on and on. I think that the um, that becomes being allowed alone a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think again, I I think it's such a fascinating. Uh, it, it's fascinating to watch people, both in this work and other works, and the sense of awe. But I, I'm interested in this, this question of transcendence, which, you know, is often, uh, you know, linked with art, almost this, I mean, certainly we have these 50s notions of Rothko and the sort of transcendence of the everyday. And, you know, the uh, transcendence also implies escape. Um, so it can be a kind of problematic term. What are we transcending, or are we just being in it? Uh, Woody Allen was said very good. I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be around when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, death is a big item, and uh, how, having children pass on. I mean, I'm not arguing against these things, but all these things. One of the things abstract expressions were accused of the problem for. Um, I mean, for all of them, basically, they're saying, my God, all this paint's going to fall off in a few years or, or it's going to disintegrate. I mean, for a, somebody who's having a, a museum and trying to, you know, m underwrite this idea of transcendence in a way, uh, it's a bit of a disaster. And in a way, so the proposition is very simple. You can, you can do something really quite beautiful that will last forever, and therefore that mark has been made. Or you could do something sensational, something even better, and it only lasts for like a week or a month. You have a choice to make. And uh, it's not just about being a painter. It's, it has to do with uh, you, this history of modern art is at least a challenge and at least an opportunity to have this discussion about exactly how do we feel about these things uh, and how do we, in a sense, order them? How do we put them together in a sense of our life and our sets of values? I was saying about the thing of, of creating um, uh, 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 the idea of, of values. Where do we place the values? If you, uh, I, I, I'm, I watch all the time. Whenever, whenever you see the price of art go up in somebody's uh, market, as it were, what you're not, what you're seeing, in a sense, is not buying art. They are buying history now, and incredible prices are paid for history, but, but finally, not really for art. It's a different, uh, different set of values there, even though 
problem is, I oh, won't get a long story. <laughs> well, I think the question and the continuing question in the sense of uh, consciousness that's also part of this, because when you talk about perception and the attention to detail and seeing things that you didn't know were there and then you focus on, um, it really implies being there, being in your body. And there is a responsibility that comes with that. And I, I think if you want to call it value, um, whatever word wants, but there's something responsible about being a human in the world, in interaction as part of a society. And I suppose for me, you know, art matters so much because it's become a place that in many ways is one of the rare places where you can allow yourself that level of experience. Um, and so I, I hope we keep building museums since we're building another one downtown, uh, a great new building. Um, I think that, you know, <laughs> uh, I think that Boy, there have uh, been a lot of bad museums built and, we'll and, and basically the, the key is that they're unethical uh, they've not in a sense uh, uh, taken one of the responsibilities that an architect has which by the way I love the idea of being an architect but the idea of an architect essentially uh, has a responsibility I mean a number of responsibilities that's what makes it such a complex and interesting discipline in a way um, and the problem with museums is they're like a blue sky and nobody wants to argue with them. So they build themselves a, a, an artwork. And they all secretly want to be an artist in a way because it's a much more fun activity. No, I mean, but fundamentally what matters is what's going on in, inside the walls of the, of the museum. That, well, that's, that, really that's, the, that's really the value. It, it, it has to service all those. And when it becomes a... Well, I'll, I'll give Frank Gehry a pass on uh, on uh, uh, Bill, Bao, Bill Bao on Bill Bao because they didn't really ask for a museum. They wanted a, a monument. They wanted a, a tourist attraction, and they got one. It was a good one. So I, I can't argue with him on that one. But um, most of the time, uh, they're bad museums. They, you know, they don't. That's one of the reasons I took on the project at, at, at Dia. Uh, artists, other artists complained about the idea of an artist doing it because they said, well, we're going to end up being working within the Irwin, you know. And I take great pride in the fact that uh, there's no architectural items. You don't really look at it as an architectural uh, uh, thing in itself. It's just a really nice place to spend time. And I almost feel like I didn't do anything, you know. It's, uh, it's, 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 yeah, but that's the best art, in a sense well. because it's all there. But you just, you, you, you it, it, when you install in a place like that, you know that there are things that have been thought through. Well, one of the things about, say, new, uh, that situation, it was a fairly complex situation. They had a collection. Uh, they had to do something with it. They couldn't just leave it in boxes and in, in, in freight, I mean, in, in warehouses. Um, like the modern at one time had a decision whether or not they were going to be a practicing participant in the, in the moment as a modern museum. Uh, or were they, in a sense, going to be a collection? Uh, they decided to be a collection, which is terrific because it's a great collection. I love going there. Uh, it's, it's a very responsible decision. But at the point, that piece that I did there at the Modern... And what's 1970 with, uh, with Jenny Lick? Jenny Lick essentially kept that program going in a way called... Uh, uh, what did they have? It was uh, part of the project uh, series. Projects, project yeah. series. This was, right. a, this was a project that uh, Bob did in an ALCO space, really, right? A kind of... <laughs> oh, that was, that's a hard one. We'll, we'll go to that right okay. now. But, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, they, there was a, they didn't make an irresponsible decision, but they made a very clear one that it, it were committed them to be, in a sense, historical. Uh, and then at some point it has to become a, a teaching because the history, in a sense, fades, becomes more vague and so on for us at this moment. And so it now has to take on a teaching responsibility. These are all the kind of natural developments in the museum. Oh. Uh, but, um, uh, but the modern ceased to become the modern. Oh. It's not a modern museum. It hasn't been a modern museum for a very long time. Um, the um, uh, DIA, in a way, made a different decision. The reason why that was put out there was to take care of the responsibility of having a collection and not just leaving it. But they wanted really to stay, or Michael wanted to stay in New York and, and be a, a modern, uh, mm -hmm. radical, uh, experimental space. And uh, uh, there became a, a, a split, I guess, among the sponsors and, and himself. And so he left town and went to L.A., which has um, been a very interesting to observe. The guy's very smart. 
and he's doing a very interesting job out there. Just in terms of this, he wanted to stay in New York, and the site he found and proposed to his that's board right. was the site the Whitney's going to be in. That's right. That's our new. That's our new site. So it's yeah. a pretty good site. Pretty good. It's a pretty site. Pretty good site. I think one of the great things about working on this project with you, um, and it really is at the heart, in a sense of what I think the Whitney is very strong at, and why, why I'm here, um, was. The, 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 the level of engagement of everybody, obviously, to make a piece like this, to reinstall the piece from my colleague, Peter Scott, who worked on the floor and Delano and the registrars and, and the whole idea of the piece coming together in this way and the experience of it. And I think that that, you know, that direct experience that you've given us, is, the questions keep getting asked. I, I know you're not satisfied maybe with the answers, but I think the important thing is that the questions keep getting asked. And I, we are just so grateful to you for asking those questions and for being here this evening. And what do you think? Should we, should we wrap it up? I Anything think so. more? Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Very much.